evening. It's good to see each and every one of you out at our Bible study and prayer meeting this evening. Uh, We're going to stand and sing our opening hymn. It is not in the red book. It's going to be on the screen. Our last hymn, you will need the red book, but it'll be on the screen. Our opening hymn this evening is Facing a Task Unfinished That Drives Us to Our Knees. A need that undiminished rebukes our slothful ease. We who rejoice to know thee renew before thy throne the solemn pledge we owe thee to go and make thee known. Our theme for this month and the title of our series is going to be From Lethargy Awake. And that little line is in this hymn. And so as you sing it, you can think about it. It's a prayer that indeed the Lord would awaken us from our spiritual slumber. So as we stand, we'll sing this hymn together and praise the Lord as we do so. before the Lord. Let's ask him to bless us this evening as we meet around his word. Um, As always, we want the Lord to speak to us as we gather here in a Wednesday evening. We want to know his presence with us. And I trust that as you come tonight that you're expecting the Lord to speak to you because each time his word is open, he promises that it doesn't return unto him void. And he promises that he will speak to each of us. So let's come before him now. Let's ask for his help. Let's ask for his blessing upon us this evening. Our Father, we come into your most holy presence this evening. And we do so in and through the precious name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. How precious our Savior is to us this evening. If it hadn't been for the Lord Jesus Christ, if he hadn't gone to the cross of Calvary, had he not died in our place, had he not died for the sin of the world, we would sit here tonight a hopeless people. 
But Father, we come to you and we praise you and we give you thanks that this evening we can rejoice in the cross work of Christ, for he has bought our redemption. Father, we are a ransomed people. We've been bought by the blood of the Lamb. And Father, tonight we're part of your family. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you, Father, for the day and hour that you saved us. We thank you, Father, as we come before you tonight, that we say, now I belong to Jesus, and Jesus belongs to me, not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. Oh, Father, we are so grateful as we gather with your people tonight. We are so grateful that we gather around this precious book before us, the Word of God, the Bible. We thank you, Father, that within it there are found no errors. We thank you, Father, that as we read it, that the Spirit of God ministers to each of our hearts. And, Father, we thank you for the desire that you have planted in our hearts to gather this evening and to listen to your word preached. And so, Father, as we gather in this place tonight, we pray, Father, that you will speak to our hearts. Father, we come expecting you to minister to us. And so, Father, as we open it, as we listen to the challenge and encouragement of your word, Father, we pray that it will mold us and change us, and that, Father, indeed, that we would become more and more like our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that this evening, as we come, that later on we will make our requests known to you as we come before the throne of grace as a church assembly. And, Father, we thank you for the place of public prayer. We thank you, Father, that as we come before you tonight, that you hear our prayer, that, Father, you answer our prayer. And, Father, we so often take this for granted, that a holy God would listen to a prayer such as ours. But we thank you, Father, that you love us with an everlasting love, and you care for us intimately. So, Father, we thank you for this place that we can gather this evening. But, Father, of course, as we have sang this evening, how we realize that today there is a task that is unfinished. We realize, dear God, that indeed the gospel and your hand of mercy and grace has still be ex has st is still extended towards men and women, boys and girls. And, Father, we thank you that it is not the will of the Father that any should perish. And, Father, we come before you tonight, and we do want to renew the pledge before your throne that we should go and make you known. Father, we want to be a people who make a difference in this world for our Lord. We want to be useful in your work. So, Father, we pray indeed for fresh cleansing this evening. We pray, Father, that we would be useful vessels that you can flow through, channels that you can use. That, Father, wherever we are, be it work, be it school, be it our neighbors, be it in the shop, that, Father, we would be great witnesses and ambassadors for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we pray for those who would love to be gathered with us this evening, who are unable to be here. And Father, we just pray indeed that you would bless them abundantly this evening, maybe as they listen in online. Father, maybe as they listen at a later date on the recording. And Father, we just pray that they will know your presence with them, that you're constantly there for them, and you're the God who will never leave them nor forsake them. Father, we thank you tonight that you are here with us. But, Father, we want to know your presence with us. Father, I pray for your help tonight. Father, I need your help as I share your word. And, Father, I take a step back and I ask you to speak. Father, I pray that nothing of me would be heard tonight, and that the only thing that would be taken from this meeting are the words of God and the things that you want to say to each of us tonight. Father, will you just help us in this place tonight? May we know your presence in a very real way. And Father, we pray in all this for your glory alone. And in the precious name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. 
Well, it's good to see each of you out this evening. It really is. And let me bid you a warm welcome, you who have gathered here. We also want to welcome those who join us on Facebook Live. And we thank you for joining us. There are so many who join us from different parts of the UK and further afield. And we thank you, uh, first of all, for listening. And so often, many of you are commenting under our services. And we appreciate your encouragements. And we appreciate how you engage with our services as well. On Friday, Woody's Bible study will meet at 12.15 p.m. Uh, Saturday, the church hall will be open from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Um, for another appeal for Ukraine. But this particular time, what they're looking for is only non-perishable foods. And if you're available and able to help at that, I'm sure George would appreciate that. Um, don't forget, actually, as well, excuse me, on Friday, men, um, you have your fellowship dinner as well. I nearly forgot that. Um, George will shoot my boots. Uh, but don't forget also Street Cafe is on on Saturday morning. That's going to take a slightly different form with the, with the Ukraine appeal happening. What we've decided to do is set up the, the Street Cafe just out there in the car park. And we're just going to hand tracks and little sort of sweets or biscuits or whatever we have available uh, to folks as they pass by just to encourage them. There were many unsaved came through through the church car park last time um, and we want to make sure that we take the opportunity as people come through and donate. That takes us round to this Lord's Day, Sunday the 10th of April. The Sunday school and Bible class will meet at 10 a.m. The prayer meeting at 10.45 a.m. The morning service and breaking of bread at 11 30 a.m. and God willing I will be speaking this Sunday morning prayer then at 5 45 p.m. our gospel service at 6 30 p.m. and God willing Pastor Taylor will be responsible for the gospel service this Lord's Day the youth fellowship will meet at 8 p.m. and Grace Kelly will be sharing with the young people the next installment of our little series that we've been doing throughout the year inspirational Bible characters don't forget this Tuesday the elders will meet at 7.30 p.m. and then the deacons will join at 8.30 p.m. Uh, don't forget our special Good Friday service on the 15th. Uh, that's not this Friday, but the following Friday. Do put that in your diary. God willing, it will be a good night of fellowship together. Peter Mander will be along to sing to us and we will break bread together at the end of that service. Also remember, if you're involved in the children's work in the church, um, please do put Thursday the 18th of May in your diaries. Uh, that night will be a child protection evening. David Jackson will be along to, uh, to take that evening. And it's so important that you are there, uh, simply because if you're not there, you cannot be involved in the work with the children and young people in our church in any way, whether that be in a Sunday morning or with the youth or with the children in any of the work. So please do put Thursday the 18th of May in your diaries and plan on being along. Also, don't forget the church dinner, which will be on Friday the 29th of April. Places are limited. All of the sheets went on Sunday. There are a limited amount available out in the hall this evening, but please do book in for that as soon as possible because places are limited. All of these announcements are made subject to the will of the Lord. Well, we're turning in our Bibles this evening, please, to the book of Malachi. We're turning to the book of Malachi, and we're starting this new series, which we're calling From Lethargy Awake. From Lethargy Awake. And this evening, our study, we're entitling it, our first study, A Lesson on God's Love. A Lesson on on God's love. So our overall series title is From Lethargy Awake, and then our title for our study this evening is A Lesson on God's Love. Malachi chapter 1, please. This evening we're just going to deal with the first five verses of Malachi chapter 1 as we seek to introduce the series and also deal with these first five verses. Malachi chapter 1, please, and the verse 1. This is the word of the Lord, and it reads, The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, Wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau. 
and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down, and they shall call them the border of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. And your eyes shall see, and ye shall say, The Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. We trust the Lord will bless the reading of his word to each of our hearts this evening. We have been singing this evening already in our opening hymn that, that, that beautiful hymn, Facing a Task Unfinished. And let me just read the final verse of that hymn again. It says, O Father who sustained them, O Spirit who inspired, Savior whose love constrained them to toil with zeal untired. Now these two lines I feel are so important for us as the church of Christ today. From cowardice, defend us. From lethargy, awake. For if on thine errand send us to labor for thy sake. And as we come to study this little prophecy tucked in at the end of the Old Testament, we'll discover that the nation of Israel had lost touch with God. They had become lethargic in their walk with the Lord. And we come to a time of waiting in the history of Israel. They were waiting for the Messiah to come. And someone has said that this period in Israelite history was the period after all of the fireworks. It was after the climax and after the great crescendo. There wasn't much happening. It was an anticlimax in Israelite history. Nothing of significance is going on. And because of this, it led to apathy and it led to backsliding and it even led to the people questioning God. Now, I ask you the question tonight, under the title of our series, From Lethargy Awake, are we not in a similar time as the church tonight? We're in a time of waiting. Yes, we are now living in the church period, but we're in a time of waiting in the history of God. You must acknowledge that we're not living, no matter what the charismatics claim, at times with great signs and wonders, we're not living in apostolic times. The apostles, those who spent time with the Lord Jesus, they have died, they have passed on, that era is over. And even though we have known revivals, even the history of, in the history of our own land through the years, we in this corner of the world, in the corner of God's world, we're certainly not experiencing revival at this very moment. Now, in one sense, we're to expect that. The apostles teach us through the epistles that God's people in this age of grace are to be people who live more by faith and less by sight. You remember in John chapter 10, 20, in verse 29, the Lord Jesus was speaking to doubting Thomas, and he said to Thomas, You have seen and believed, but blessed are they who do not see, yet believe. In 2 Corinthians, Paul told us, and the church in Corinth, that we walk by faith and not by sight. We see less, but we still believe. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 8, Peter gives the same sentiment. He says, Whom having not seen, ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. And of course, we do wait for the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, in the rapture of the church, which is the next great event that will happen in God's calendar. But in this period of waiting, I believe the church has become weak in their walk with the Lord. And it was the same situation that we find in Malachi's day. They had simply settled for what you might call routine religion. They had become stagnant in their worship and in their lifestyle, 
And the Lord, through the prophet Malachi, brings a series of six messages to the children of Israel, seeking to awaken them from their laziness or lethargy. And that's what that line in the hymn, when we sing it, really means. From lethargy awake, from spiritual laziness, from spiritual slumber, we're praying that the Lord will awaken us. We're praying and asking the Lord to awaken us out of a, a sleep that we're in in these days. And in the spiritual slumber that we're in, how we disappoint the Lord so often. Spiritual slumber, not just... Do I talk about individuals? I'm talking about wholesale. I'm talking about the church of Christ in our country, in Northern Ireland. We have fallen into a spiritual sleep. So that's what we're calling our little series for over the next few weeks, From Lethargy Awake. And I don't want it just to be a title. My prayer is that the Lord will awaken me and that the Lord will awaken each of us as we go through this book to our spiritual laziness. And I want to define very quickly what I'm talking about when I talk about this laziness or lethargy. This local church or any local church can appear very active. And there can be lots of activities going on. And from the outside, we could make an impression on the world that the Lord is really blessing lots of activity going on in there. And that's the mistake that I believe that many assemblies of all evangelical denominations are making in our province. It's still spiritual lethargy if our hearts are not found in the right place. It's not about activity. It's about the heart. The Lord sees our motive behind our activity. And the question is, is the church... Are we asking the Lord what he wants us to be doing? Or are we just making plans for the church and simply placing it then in the Lord's hands? Or are we asking him, or are we asking him to guide our plans? Do you remember in Revelation 2, the message the Lord had for the church in Ephesus? He actually commended them for their activity. He commended them for what they were doing. But then we read on and he says this, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. I trust as we set up camp in this prophecy that each of us will be challenged and that we'll be awakened. Warren Wearsby opens his commentary in the book of Malachi with this illustration. A church member scolded her pastor for preaching a series of sermons entitled The Sins of the Saints. After all, she argued, the sins of Christians are different than the sins of other people. Yes, agreed her pastor, they are far worse. The people in Malachi's day were certainly living in sin. Therefore God called Malachi to enter the scene and to share God's message with them. Let's very quickly get a background to who we're talking about tonight. Who is the prophet? What do we know about him? Who are the people that he's ministering to? And what stage of Israel's history are we entering into? Let's begin with the prophet. Who is the prophet? Who is the prophet? Well, look at verse 1 with me. It reads, The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. Of course, you'll probably know that this book makes up one of the 12 minor prophets that we find in the Old Testament. And of course, we have five larger prophecies as well. And needless to say, the reason why Malachi and the other 11, 11 are considered as minor prophets is due to the length of the book and not its content. This book is inspired by the Spirit of God, who is the author of all Scripture, and the Spirit of God has something to teach us through the book of Malachi. When it comes to the Word of God itself, it doesn't tell us much more about the character of Malachi and who he was. It tells us nothing more. Some have suggested that this particular book was written anonymously, noting that the name of Malachi means my messenger or the Lord's messenger. However, I believe, while his name might mean my messenger, I believe that this book was written and proclaimed by an actual man called Malachi, 
just as the other minor prophets were written, they were real men. They were people who stood in the history of time. I don't believe that Malachi is an anonymous person. I believe Malachi was a man who walked and breathed in this earth. Malachi's name, it doesn't appear anywhere else in Scripture. As far as I can see or read about it, I stand to be corrected. But the only thing we read of Malachi is that first verse. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. You know, I find it very interesting. Uh, the first study that I took when I arrived here at Bambridge Baptist was in the book of Habakkuk. And if you were to read the book of Habakkuk, it actually talks about the burden that Habakkuk had. And that's all really we know about the character of Habakkuk as well. They both had a burden. And that burden was from the word of the Lord. We learn in this book that Malachi, he had a burden. In his book, he had no time for introductions to tell us all about himself. No time for giving us his biography. He simply wants to bring a message and the, the burden of God to his listeners. And what that teaches us is this, that the word of God is so much more important than the person who delivers it. Alistair Begg has said that. You see, when it comes to Malachi, his credentials are all in his call. And his significance is in his sermon. And there's no time for these personal introductions. This man, he meant business with God. And he wanted people to see God. He didn't want his name magnified. He wanted God's name magnified. He wanted people to see the Lord and not himself. And dear brothers and sisters, as you listen this evening, let me remind you that the message that this book before us is always greater than the man who delivers it. Never think that someone who stands in the pulpit is a great person. It's the message that is important. It's Scripture which is important. It's that the Lord speaks to you is important. Do you remember the people when they were asking John the Baptist who he was? It's recorded in the Gospel of John in chapter 3. And they were saying, are you this person? No. Are you, are you that person? No. And they kept on questioning him. They thought he was a really, really important person. And today we would be looking at John with frustration. Well, we need some title to put on the screen for you. Well, we need something to put in the church bulletin. We need some title to let people know how important the person coming to take our church conference is. And then John, he turns to tell them. He says, I'm just a voice in the wilderness. I'm just a light shining for a little while, and then I fade away. I'm just a finger that points to the Savior. He must increase. I must decrease. I believe that's Malachi's attitude. And it should be mine. And it should be yours. Do you want to know what your role is, dear child of God, while here on earth? It's not to bring glory to your own name. It's to point others to Christ. John the Baptist was a voice. And it was about the message, not the man. And Malachi was a voice who brought the burden of the Lord. It was the message, not the man. That's all we know about the prophet. But who were the people that he was ministering to? Who were the people that God called him to speak to? Of course, we've already identified that Malachi, he came and he was speaking to the children of Israel. But more specifically, he was speaking to approximately 50,000 exiles who had returned from Judah, to, who had returned to Judah from Babylon. You'll remember how the people of Israel had been taken captive due to their disobedience. And the Babylonians had came and they'd taken them away from their land. They had destroyed Jerusalem and they were in Babylon for nearly 70 years. But after this time, when they had been exiled and when they had been prisoner to the Babylonians, they were able to return. And the temple had, re had been rebuilt under the leadership of Zerubbabel. And the sacrificial system had been renewed. 
And you'll remember how Ezra and Nehemiah had been involved in the return to proper worship. And Malachi then came onto the scene 100 years after Ezra and Nehemiah. You'll remember uh, uh, how Ezra and Nehemiah, in Nehemiah chapters 8, 9, and 10, they almost held a Bible conference. And there were three things happened at that Bible conference, if you like. The first thing that ha happened was that they were, the, the people were encouraged to return to the word of the Lord. In chapter 8, what happens in Nehemiah is they stand up and they listen to the word of God being proclaimed. And they listen to it and they accept it. And then in Nehemiah chapter 9, we find the longest prayer found in Scripture. And in Nehemiah chapter 9, what you read of is how the people, they worship the Lord and look back over the history of Israel and they pray to the Lord and there's a renewal and a revival in prayer. And then in chapter 10 of Nehemiah, what happens is that the people, they come together and they write a pledge and they make a covenant with the Lord. And what they do is they say and they commit to living holy lives. They just don't listen to the word of the Lord and then return to prayer. But then in chapter 10, they actually make this pledge. And you can see a list of names in Nehemiah chapter 10 of all those who signed that covenant that they were going to go back to holy living, that they were going to live for the Lord. That's 100 years before the events that are happening here. Jerusalem has been rebuilt and the surrounding places. The temple has been rebuilt. Now we're 100 years on. Not much has really happened during that time. And unfortunately, as often as the case with the children of Israel, they're no longer walking with God as they ought. In fact, Andrew Hill in his commentary tells us how tough the crowd to whom Malachi preaching really was. He says this. He says, Malachi's sermons were directed to a tough audience. His congregation included the righteous, the disillusioned, the cynical, the callous, the dishonest, the apathetic, the doubting, the skeptical, and the outright wicked. What does a preacher have to say to a crowd like that? Well, let's find out. There's six particular themes that Malachi deals with, six issues that the Lord has with the people, and we're going to deal with these over the next few weeks. And the six issues are this. The people were denying God's love. The people were despising God's name. The people were defiling God's covenants. They were doubting God's justice. They were disobeying God's word, and they were despising God's service. We're going to deal with each of those. But this evening, we're going to think about how they were denying God's love. Denying God's love. And what remains, and what remains this evening, we'll deal with these first five verses. You see, in these verses, I want you to note just three things this evening in our time that remains. And the first of those is this. We see God's love declared. We see God's love declared. Look at verse 1 and the start of verse 2 with me again. It says, The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. And it says, I have loved you, saith the Lord. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Through God's messenger, God reminds the people here that he loves them. That he loves them. And this is a truth that has stood the test of time. God loves you. And yet God points out this first sign that the people were having, the first sign of the spiritual bankruptcy that the people had, God points out to them their lack of acknowledging, their lack of belief that God loves them. They needed reminded that God loved them. But you see, they respond. And you'll find with each of these six issues that, the God, that God deals with the people, it's a horrible book to read when you read the responses of God's people. Because each time that God says something to them, they retort and they question God. And it begins in verse 2. God says to them, I have loved you, saith the Lord. And listen to what the people say. They go, how have you loved us? Yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Prove it, God. They're so insensitive to his love. 
And you know, in this little line where it says, I have loved you, at the start of verse 2, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful, when you look into it, when you look into the meaning behind it, it actually means that God is saying, I have loved you deeply. I have loved you deeply. In the Hebrew language here, it's meant in the perfect tense. God's not saying, not only have I loved you in the past, God's saying, I love you now. And no matter what happens right now, I'm going to love you tomorrow. It's a perfect love. And God's love is ever present with us, and he will forever love us no matter what we do. Whatever's going on in your life, the truth is that God loves you, and he cares for you. Is that not a beautiful thought to consider this evening? I wonder, are you going through the toughest of trials right now? And you don't know where to turn. And could it be that in your trial that you've doubted God's love for you? Could it be that in your trial you've, you've questioned where God is, where God is working? And today we live in a day at times of crippling doubt. And that's the way it was in Malachi's day. And yet here, Malachi's message can be applied to our day as we hear the words that the Lord declares right at the outset of the book. I love you. No matter what, dear believer, let it never be forgotten that God loves you. He indeed is love divine. His word declares from start to finish. I love you. And here in Malachi tonight, God reminds a doubting people that he loves them. His love is declared. But we also see that God's love is denied. It's doubted. We've read it already in verse 2, as the people say, Yet ye say, Wherein hast thou loved us? They're saying to God, Prove it. Prove that you love us, God. And the people, they keep coming back with these responses. And the Lord, he'll make all these righteous accusations against the people throughout this book. And each time they're met with cynical questions. And the answers reveal that, and the answers that they give the Lord reveal how far they were from God at the time. We're talking about God's people here. We're not talking about the surrounding nations. We're talking about the people who belong to God, that God had chosen. And here we see the people, and they just come back. And they come back each time, and they say to the Lord as he makes their accusations, what do you mean, Lord? We're not guilty of these things. And here tonight they say, Lord, prove that you love us. Here they were. They'd come back from Babylon and with blood, sweat, and tears, they had rebuilt the temple. They had rebuilt Jerusalem. They had rebuilt the surrounding cities. And they had turned their backs on centuries of idolatry. And they had reinstituted the worship of God. And they're saying to God, look at all our activity. Look at all that we've done for the Lord. Look at all we've done for you. And yet you accuse us of not loving us. we are loving you. Their activity, the things that men see, look to be spiritual, but it serves to remind us that God sees our heart. How's your heart tonight? I wonder, do you serve here in this local church? Maybe you're involved in the work with the children. Maybe you're involved in cleaning. Maybe you're involved in some small work in this church. I don't know. But let me ask you, and let me say, first of all, I am thankful for all those who serve in this local church. I'm thankful that there are so many who are willing to put their shoulder to the weight and work for the Lord here. But let me ask you this. This is between you and the Lord and no one else. When you serve, are you doing it for the approval of the people around you here in the church? Or are you doing it for the approval of the Lord? Remember, while it's good to be involved in serving in the church, it's important that we're working for the Lord, seeking his approval, 
Remember the importance of maintaining a daily walk with him. Remember, we must spend time reading his word and in prayer and sitting at his feet. Here, the children of Israel, they were involved in all this activity. But had God rewarded them? No. Had he restored this glorious kingdom that they thought the Messiah was going to bring? No. Had he fulfilled the promises that many a prophet who had gone before knew? So then they questioned, how could God love them? God's love was declared to them. They doubted God's love. But then God goes on and he demonstrates his love to them in these verses. God shows them how he has loved them. And God points to his love in the past. Look at verse 2 and 3 here. Uh, right at the end, after the people have said, Wherein hast thou loved us? God goes on and he says, Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and led his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau. You know, I like, I, I was t reading a few different commentaries in this, and I, I like how Dennis Lyle sums this up in Journey Through the Bible. Uh, and I'll recommend that series to you if you get the books or listen to what he says in this particular passage, because this is a complicated verse. And this is one that has caused so much controversy over many, many years. Jacob, I loved thee, so I hated. This is what he says. He says, this statement is also quoted by Paul in Romans 9, verse 13. To prove God's electing grace for Israel and for all who trust Christ for salvation. And it's a verse that has caused many a debate over many years, but it holds a wonderful truth. What does it mean when it says, Esau, I hate it? Well, the verb hate here mustn't be defined as an expression of the... It must be de, not be defined as an expression of the wrath of God. Rather, God's love for Jacob was so great that in comparison to his actions towards Esau, they looked like hatred. Do you remember when Jacob loved Rachel so much that his relationship with Leah, it looked like hatred? Do you remember what Christ said to his disciples? He said, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. The Lord said, if you don't hate your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your brethren, your sisters, and your own life, you can't be his disciple. The Lord Jesus there, he's using the word hate in a similar way. And here's the wonder of it all. God loves you, and you are part of the elect of God. You're part of the chosen. That's what the Bible tells us. And here we see centuries have passed since the Lord said to his people through Malachi, I love you, and he says to them, I love Jacob. And today, as the children of God, as we sit here this evening, we can say that before the foundation of the world, that he knew that we would be his child. That's a beautiful thought. That's a beautiful thought. And this evening, we can simply rejoice that God loves me. And he saved me. The all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present, holy God loves me. And he saved me. The undeserving, the unclean, the absolutely unworthy one. That's a marvelous statement. We can't see into eternity to understand this statement in full. But all I can say is you and I, dear child of God, according to my Bible, were chosen in the well-beloved. How are we to understand the love of God today? Well, I think Charles Wesley captures it well. Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die? me. You see, God has demonstrated his love in the past. 
But God also has demonstrated his love today in the present. God reminds the Israelites here that Edom showed pride and, uh, pride and self-will against the Lord. In verse 4 it says, Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. And here's what that means. Edom are a people who had rejected God. And as a result, God's curse was put upon them. And we see this in verse 4. They shall build, but I will throw them down. You know, in the book of Obadiah, we read how the Edomites, they celebrated when the Babylonians came to take Jerusalem and God's people. But ever since that day that they celebrated that God's people had been taken, God's judgment rained down on them. And Israel were under God's protection. Dear brothers and sisters, Israel, God's people were and still are under the protection of God Almighty. And you too, dear child of God, are under his protection. Even today in the present, this is how he displays his love towards us. Have you not experienced the tokens of God's love towards you today? You've experienced the truth of his word. You've experienced fellowship with his people. You've experienced wonder of his worship as we have sang together already this evening. We've experienced the guidance of his hand even throughout this day. We've experienced the provision of his strength. Was there food on your table today? Clothes on your back? Heat in your home? These are all expressions of God's ongoing love towards you. But finally this evening, as God's love is demonstrated, we see God's love in the future. In verse 5, we read these words. And God, of course, is speaking to Israel here, and he says, And your eyes shall see, and ye shall say, The Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. Israel was God's chosen instrument by means of which he intended to be magnified in all of mankind. And there's no doubt that in this verse there is a hint of millennial glory when the Lord will receive pure worship throughout the world in a day that's still to come. And we'll be part of that. But what love is this? We see his love in the past. We see his love in the present. We see his never ceasing love towards us. And we now see that his love will last through the unending cycles of eternity. Because God loves me, he sent his son from heaven to the cross to bear my sin. And now his word speaks to me through his spirit. And one day you and I in the future will reign with him forever and ever. Does that not say to you that God loves you? Let me say this to you as we draw to a close this evening. What does all this actually mean for how you and I live tomorrow? What does it actually mean? Well, let me ask, is your walk with God lacking at the moment? Is it not our time to take time to prayerfully read the word of God? Not a quick verse on our phone that we forget in a few minutes or of reading it. But time to get meditating on God's word again and spending time in prayer and seeking God for the activities of this assembly. I wonder, do we need revived in our own soul and woken up to the fact that God loves us again? Here's a lethargic people that Malachi is speaking to. And the first step that Malachi gives to spiritual revival in his people is to get back in touch with God's love for you again. If we're to be awoken from our lethargy, from lethargy to awake, we must get touched again by the eternal, never-changing love of God. We must appreciate again the love that was displayed at Calvary, the blood shed in love for you, we must appreciate the love that drew us to the Lord. And we must appreciate that one day we will be made perfect. Could we with ink the ocean fill and where the skies of parchment meet, where every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry and 
Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. I wonder, do we need to get in touch again with God's love for us? Let's pray together. Father, at times like this, we're reminded of the simple truths that we were taught as children. Even those little choruses that we sang together. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong how we can say that I am so glad that my Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest, that Jesus loves me. Father, we're so undeserving of being your children tonight. We're so sinful. And we're such an unlovable people. Yet, Father, we gather in this place tonight to worship your name because you sent your Son and have displayed your great love toward us. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We were once children of wrath. Your word tells us that. But now we're children of God part of your family, part of your kingdom. Father, we will forever rejoice and we will forever be thankful that you have saved us. Father, help us to get in touch again with your love for us. Renew our hearts tonight, we pray. And Father, we long indeed that you would waken us if we truly are spiritually asleep Father, waken us up again. Show us the need of our land. And by your Spirit, fill us afresh. Sweep through your church again. Father, will you begin here at Bambridge Baptist tonight? Will you speak to our hearts? And Father, may we have a fresh understanding and appreciation of your love towards us. Bless us now as we pray. Father, we have so many needs. And Father, we just pray that indeed we will know your presence continuing with us. And we pray this in our precious Saviour's name, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.